And if you price how many years of savings to buy a house in 1970, and I have this in the article, it was 2.4 years of, of savings could effectively buy you, you know, a house. Now it's seven years, right? And you're talking five extra years of you working to be able to make sure that you can maintain like and like buy a home and i think this is part of like other forces in society where like people aren't having as many kids because there's a large sense of uncertainty in like how am i going to be able to provide like my next rent check let alone provide for another kid right and i think this is usually what you see among bitcoiners as a general group right just to, like to talk and generalizations usually tend to be more optimistic they want to have kids um they believe that you know there is a better future to be had for our kids what and this kind is of future point. and world and civilization will our children grow up and this is the main question this is essential question especially for parents like myself and uh, for so many others who have children who want to have you know a better future uh, full of prosperity and abundance and freedom and joy and pleasure and evolution on every level you can think of. So this is why I want to talk with Robert Hamilton. I'm really looking forward to speak to in connection with this article um, on Bitcoin Magazine, which we're going to put up in the show notes. And it's called, uh, the title is called, Why has the physical world not progressed like the di digital? Bitcoin is poised to fix the fiat, create problems which inhibit potential progress. So, uh, so the question is, you know, how are we going to and, and how will Bitcoin, you know, uh, as a digital and physical truth, stop all these lies, the institutional, the deeply institutional and structural uh, corruption and criminality and lies and build a better f uh, future, better world for our descendants, for our children to live in. So I'm really looking forward to my talk with Robert Hamil Hamilton and uh, let me know what you think. And I'm sure you're going to enjoy this as much as I did. Thank you. Alrighty, Rob, Rob Excellent. Hamilton. Thanks so much. Good to meet you. Uh, unfortunately, not in person, but I'd love to Turn one day. <laughs> All right. Hard, I hear man. the echo. There you go. Yeah, I heard. I heard an echo in the background there. Yeah. <laughs> So, man, what are you up to? I mean, uh, can you tell me, uh, my listeners, a little bit about your background before we talk, you know, start talking about your, your article, which I really love. It's so many aspects which you covered, which I think have, have been ignored, which touches upon, you know, uh, a lot of facets that I talked about with Jeff Booth and others. So, Rob Hamilton, welcome to the show. And uh, yeah, just yeah. go ahead and tell me a little bit about yourself. Happy to, yeah. And uh, just make sure, I get your, your, is it pronounced Kevin? I want to make sure. Or no, Kevon? it's actually Kayvon. Like, uh, Kayvon. It's pronounced okay. key to the van, but uh, but it's pronounced uh, Kayvon. Kayvon, okay. Kayvon no Davani, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we're going to be oh, talking wow. for a bit. Want to use your name, yeah. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, Kayvon. Um, so, for me, I've, uh, I guess to talk about, like, in the big picture, my Bitcoin journey, I started... Uh, following bitcoin in like late 2013 or like 2014 uh it's a funny origin story where everyone has that you know a friend that tells you about it and you kind of forget about it and then like that was like probably in 2013 like beginning of 2013 and around like middle end of 2013 to 2014 i believe if i have my timeline correctly um dogecoin was around and i started mining dogecoin for as a joke on my desktop right like you know, I've never really held onto those coins or anything. It was just kind of this funny thing. And it was this interesting idea of like a computer being able to generate value, right? Like the idea that I'm doing something in the digital world and it's having like this greater impact and consequence around me. Uh, and at the time, just having internet money, right? So uh, I was living in New York City at the time and I went to uh, like find out like, oh, are there Bitcoin meetups? And I discovered there's this thing called BitDevs. Uh, BitDevs is like the predominant, like, Bitcoin developer meetup. And I went there and there was probably maybe 40 people in the room, 30 people in the room. And everyone were like, they were all wizards. And I'm someone with a background. I got my degree in math and economics. Um, I've always been good with computers, but never actually wrote code. Uh, that's back then. Since then, I've, um, I'm now, my background is a data scientist and a consultant. So uh, Bitcoin has been part of that journey for me in learning how to program. But in 2014, 
I would go to like these meetings and I would just sit there and listen for you know, two hours. The Socratic meetings are incredible. If you ever have an opportunity to go to a bit devs, I highly recommend it. You usually have, you know, two or three people leading a, a general discussion and Socratic as in like the Socratic method where there, there may be someone guiding the conversation, but there is no one running the meeting, right? Anyone can jump in, ask questions, you know, have like break off discussions. Like it's a very open platform, very much mirrors kind of the, uh, the philosophy behind Bitcoin itself. Right. Uh, and I just started learning over time about Bitcoin and just like it, you're like a sponge. And I, I think Marty Ben has said this, that you just go to a bit devs. And even if you're not a programmer, you maybe pick up 5% of what you learn, but it's still an incredible knowledge transfer. So I started going to the bit dev meetups. Um, I was, you know, a kid recently out of college, you know, working jobs. Uh, actually at the time I was working at a company called major league gaming, which is like at the time it was like the predominant like esports um, production company and like competitive platform in the United States, and I was the crazy guy running around the office with like, you know, two Bitcoin on my phone, right, like four or five hundred dollars, and being like, oh, here's like point one Bitcoin, yeah, like, here, isn't it so cool? We're using digital money, right? Like I got so fascinated with the idea that I was locking in value in this digital form, so. Uh, I actually had one friend reach out to me who didn't delete his wallet. So he basically got like, you know, a couple thousand dollars. Up. And I, I, cause I was just sending Bitcoin to people like showing them how cool it was. Uh, anyway, so uh, over time, you know, kind of kept in touch with Bitcoin, working a day job, you know, like living my life. And it was one of these things that I, I was always from the outside looking in following Bitcoin. Uh, it was just something I'd always like, you know, keep in touch on Twitter or back in like 2015, 2016 on Reddit was usually like where the good discussion was. And, uh, you know, just always kind of like, you know, kept an eye on it, always found it interesting. It was actually what motivated me to learn how to program in uh, about a year and a half ago. I actually quit my job uh, to go to Lambda school. And I basically did a nine month full time data science programming boot camp where I basically from the ground up, like really dove in and taught myself Python. And then I got hired back at my old job to be a consultant and a data scientist there. And, uh, yeah, so like, and that's just kind of like a quick peek background into my story. But uh, and for general, for me, Bitcoin has just been this thing that it, it it's over time just consuming more and more of my like my spare time capacity, right? Like I'm always listening to Bitcoin podcasts. I'm always keeping in touch on Bitcoin Twitter. And for me, it's just this, you know, as everyone says, like it's a rabbit hole. You go deeper down, and you get a deeper, more and larger of an appreciation. And for me, I was in Bitcoin Miami which was like this incredible, like, like a uh, emotional blow off top, right? In the sense that like, this was like this, like, finally, I hadn't been to a Bitcoin conference since 2014. Cause I just, it was always like, Bitcoin was a part of my life, but it wasn't my life. Yeah. So I'd always be moving but around traveling. So, that's yeah. good for you. You, you made it there because I couldn't, you know, it just, you know, to, you know, got a baby like yourself and it's just, uh, yeah. 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 And then, yeah. you know, I mean, European Union and Austria, it's, you know, I didn't want to hassle with all this bullshit with vaccinate, whatever, you know, lockdown and, and quarantine and whatever. Yeah. So. I can only imagine, right. Like how much overhead it is for you to get there. Um, li living in the States. And, uh, at the time my wife was only, you know, just seven months pregnant and she was very, uh, graceful in letting me make that trip down there. So, uh, yeah, and going to Miami was an incredible experience getting to meet a lot of people I have, I have known and talked to for years, people I've, you know, had a lot of conversations with and read a lot of their work. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I came out of the conference just more recharged than ever about, uh, Bitcoin and, uh, basically wondering like, uh, how do I want to start thinking of ways of contributing, giving back. And, uh, I think ultimately maybe I'm going to start trying to write some code and like trying to build some software that works in the space. But the first thing I just had on my mind was this article. And as one last closing thought, uh, Clubhouse has been where I've spent a lot of time over the past seven, eight months just yeah. talking about Bitcoin. I'd read about Bitcoin for years uh -huh. and never really had conversations about it, right? So uh, it was a really great opportunity for me to talk about Bitcoin, um, which one, built me up my confidence even more so, but two, allowed me to try and find ways to communicate new ideas I've had about Bitcoin, right? It was It's one thing to be reading and consuming, but when you're putting conversations and ideas out there, you get this good exchange back and forth and it really starts to inform your own worldview, right? So part of like this creative process was uh, also kicked off me wanting to write the article. Yeah, I finally, um, I just noticed a few days ago that I can, um, f for the first time, I'm able to open up uh, um, uh, Twitter spaces, not Clubhouse, but Twitter spaces. Sure. 
So I think this is a really excellent tool just to, you know, reach people spontaneously who are open minded or interested, whatever, who have questions. And yeah, and you know, back to your point, you know, it's a never ending rabbit hole. And what I was just going to say is that, you know, there's different, there's not like one Eureka moment, like aha moment. It's like different layers, dimensions of comprehension processes. And, you know, and it all ties in again back, you know, to what I originally wanted to talk to you about the article, your art, excellent sure. article. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, um, yeah. The, and the reason I, I loved your article, by the way, is because you started off, um, and it seemed to me like like um, what I, I interpret and interpreted it that way. You know, the first paragraphs that I read, it's like, uh, and this is my question to you: like, was there a moment when you said, "Okay, oh my God, I understand the essence and the the, the simplicity and the the huge potential uh, behind and within Bitcoin"? What was it that really? inspired you like like you know everybody has got like a different you know objective intention vision or imagination or you know values underlying underlying bitcoin like what what, what did you see when when you for the first time you know said oh my god you know this is like this is this unstoppable whatever this is absolute scars or you know yeah so i guess there's two questions there right like there was what kind of prompted me to write the article and what prompted me to like really get build conviction in Bitcoin? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so I I think just the general Bitcoin story. I, I was a huge Ron Paul fan, leaving high school, going into college, and following his campaign. I got to meet him in uh, 2012 during the Republican primary, which was a huge starstruck moment for me. And I went and shook his hand, and, and then that night, uh, my parents saw me on MSNBC. Like I have the clip still where like I'm sitting there shaking his hand awesome. <laughs> and it's just, it was a surreal moment. Um, and, and I, I was someone who had great skepticism for the economic system. Uh, I, I got my degree as a double major in math and economics and I, genuinely like it, when I was in college, I was kind of like trying to figure out what I wanted to like focus and do my studies on. And the chair of the economics department pulled me in and said, you're too smart to be a business major. You should go learn economics. And as someone who never like had that like intellectual role model, like that was like a really empowering thing. Like, oh yeah, I'm going to be an economics major. He, um, he, he would be the first one to tell you. Um, very much coming from the school of Keynesian economics. And I was the only freshman who took um, basically the central, the, the, what was the, I have to look up the exact name now. Um, it was basically uh, the monetary policy class. I took it as a second semester freshman. And uh, it was we learning about how the actual economic system worked made me more and more intensely skeptical uh, talking about, you know, you know, the Fed, and this is, you know, post financial crisis by a couple of years. So it was all old had at this point, the idea that, you know, uh, the government, the Treasury Department would issue debt, and then the Federal Reserve would buy that debt to kind of control the interest rates to help with employment in this larger system. And it's very funny, because, you know, I had like this weird sensation that like this doesn't feel in intuitively like on a gut level that um, something like like we're like we're like we can just keep making more and more money right so I think that's where a lot of, that that was kind of at the time I was buying silver um, with what little money I had you know working side jobs in college I had not heard about Bitcoin I wish I did this is back in like 2011 uh, never even heard or talked about it. Uh, Austrian so, economics? Have you had? Did you ever get in touch with Austrian economics? Because it's a classical question. Of course, probably not in in classical. So um, or... the general school, yes, uh, but it wasn't until later uh, where um, maybe I think I was around graduating college and you know economics in one lesson by Henry Hazlitt. Um, you know, starting to like follow like the Mises Institute, like reading old articles. Like it was definitely something that happened, but it was something that. Uh, wasn't part of like my traditional college background education, right? So this was this crazy, just like focus on, wow, uh, the money isn't right. And I would have conversations with my economics professor and it was always kind of shoot, shoot away saying like, oh, you'll learn over time. Like, you know, you'll figure it out. And so that was kind of my initial skepticism. And then Bitcoin comes in with, you know, this provable scarcity and a natively digital asset I was pretty quickly sold, right? At first, like I was mining Dogecoin because I found that really fun and I wanted to participate in the economy a bit, right? But ultimately, Bitcoin as like censorship resistant money, I found very compelling. So, um, which is a great kind of spin off into the article uh, where um, 
my university professor saying like, Hey, you'll figure it out. Like, you know, you're going to, you know, you'll, you're kind of a little naive. You don't understand, but you know, wait and see. Uh, I, uh, Eric Weinstein, who I think was a big piece of like the inspiration for writing this article, because uh, years before he had any sort of conversation in the Bitcoin world, I listened to his podcast, um, the portal and uh, this inaugural episode, this was actually filmed in like fall of 2019, which is, you know, really prophetic when you think about how much the world changed over the coming months, right after that podcast uh, talks about, you know, larger economic systems uh, specifically to which we can go into more detail on like this idea of the great stagnation splitting between the idea of the world of atoms and the world of bits and then embedded growth obligations. And these are like two pieces where um, Eric and Peter Thiel talk for three hours about it. And I found it to be a really compelling conversation, but not once do they mention like the gold standard being removed in 1971. They both agree that sometime in the late sixties, early seventies, uh, Peter Thiel says sometime between 1968 and 1972, the world changed. And Eric says between 1971 and 1973 changed, which in 1971, you know, we just had the 50 year anniversary of going off the gold standard. Right. So it was one of these crazy maddening things. Like how are they not talking about the money? Right. Like, it was like one of these things. That, and, um, I got, I, it was one of these interesting things that, um, I was talking with people on clubhouse, and realizing that we're all kind of circling around this general theory and no one had written about it yet. Uh -huh. So that was kind of like my inspiration of like, let me try and put some words to paper, mm -hmm. try and figure it out. And I'm very grateful for everyone who helped me kind of edit and review it along the way, try and fact check me. I tried to do my best to like uh, be honest. And this has been an interesting exercise in just, you know, putting something down to words and paper, putting my name behind it and making sure that um, trying to contribute a little bit to the the thought space of what is Bitcoin, right? And I think that the article's main intent is, it's a bridge, really. Um, Bitcoin doesn't get mentioned that much. Towards the end, you know, Bitcoin has a couple paragraphs and there's, you know, commentary about federal, like monetary policy. But this is much more, the article's intent, in my view, was to act as a bridge from these mental models that Eric and Peter Thiel talk about to, you know, the world of Bitcoin, right? And starting a conversation there about how, how does Bitcoin help fix these elements that, uh, you know, we talk about all the time in Bitcoin. So, yeah. Yeah. And there's, uh, yeah, besides a great stagnation, this is, uh, comes, you know, you mentioned that often. And then the other one is like, uh, I had to read it, reread it so I can remember. It's like embedded growth obligation. Can you like explain, okay. like, you know, for sure. listeners, like, what, what is it, what do you mean? Like, or what, you know, there's just so much word salad, uh, you know, uh, produced by, you know, these, I'm, I'm sorry to say, but these people like full of vanity and egos, like uh, Eric Weinstein and Nassim Taleb. And it, it's just a lot of word salad. Sometimes I'm just, you know they can they are able somehow to analyze the symptoms but they don't get to the core as you as you said they don't talk about money the monetary structure you know yeah um so i i think part of just processing ideas in general is kind of like reviewing uh, this is a thing from jordan peterson i took a lot of value from it, is every person you talk to you should assume there's something you can learn from them right don't don't uh just disregard someone outright and I think, and I've had conversations with Eric on Clubhouse, and I think that he sees the world so differently. There's like huge language barrier, like in conversations to be able to kind of bridge gaps. And, and that's what, why I wrote the article is to kind of like help as um, maybe like a Rosetta Stone or something to kind of like lay out in very base terms, some things he's talked about. Uh, and let's start with, uh, let's start with um the great stagnation because i think it's a pretty straightforward one relative to the meat and potatoes of embedded yeah. growth obligations so um the great stagnation is the idea that since 19 the early 70s there's been a large um stagnation in the world of atoms and by that we mean physical you know physical innovations right uh and most of our innovations since the early 70s have been in the world of bits with computers um very cleanly, uh, Peter Thiel describes it as, imagine you um, were living in the Star Trek universe, but they only built the computer, right? If you watch Star Trek, um, it's actually funny. Like you see like the computer is actually somewhat antiquated to what our world of like what computers can do today, yeah. <laughs> right? And uh, the world of physical innovation though, isn't there. There is no holodeck. There is no replicator. I had someone mention that like 3D printers are replicators and 
it's more so that they wrote software that can automate the process of generating the physical atoms, right? It's not like there's like new material or some sort of great innovation in the world of like the physical generation of stuff. It's that we've gotten software to automate much of the the physical production of stuff. Uh, and basically like, you know, there is no holodeck, there is no warp drive, right? Uh, I make this comment in the article that, you know, in 1969, we went to the moon with the equivalent graphic, like um, computing power of a graphing calculator in 1969 and today like there's a huge media fanfare because jeff bezos is able to shoot himself into space with like five million times more computing power and software assistance right and he didn't even get to the moon he just did low earth orbit and it's this general like question of like where did like our our ambition go right like like where is the new frontier to where uh we're not actually kind of breaking and fundamentally flipping the table over and reinventing societies uh Eric phrases it this way, which I think is another funny, like, I think it's a, it's a very powerful way to like break it down is that if you walk into a room right now that you're in, or just like the room you're sitting in right now, right. And you removed all of the computer screens beyond aesthetic taste, right. And like fashion, what's different between a room today and a room in like the seventies, right? 50 years. Whereas yes. if you went Excellent between a room question. between the 1970s yeah. and like the 1920s, yeah the whole world is changed right and, and the 20s to like the 1870s would be like you know the world of like 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 you can see these leapfrog generational hops but there hasn't been that recently so that's the idea of the great stagnation yeah thank you for that question because i don't want to interrupt you but i just wanted to say it's a really please do please do interrupt me i don't want to <laughs> you know why because i i always tell people why don't we ask ourselves in the last hundred years why hasn't the MBM, besides the digital realm, you know, the di digital computer, whatever, AI, why hasn't there been any kind of uh, advanced innovation? I mean, I think, uh, you know, Safed and Amuz and some other people, Jeff Booth, they, they talk about this, you know, uh, but and they touch upon it. But I think we should we should really uh, go deeper into these kind of discussions. And I'm hoping for that. This is why, you know, I, all, I really want to talk to you about this. Like, why haven't we had like really zero, as Peter Thiel calls, the zero to one technological innovations in the energy sector, in transportation, in propulsion systems, in any other you know uh, thing that is you know useful so for for you know for our civilization? Uh, and yeah, you know, I'm, I mean, I, I was going to talk about the military industrial complex where there's a lot of compartmentalized technologies, um, even in the propulsion systems. But, you know, let, let, let me, yeah, let, let's just go step by step. Yeah. So uh, I think it's a great question, right? Um, I've actually had a couple of people reach out to me with counter narratives that we aren't in a great stag stagnation. I need to go read like what they were sending me. So I want to, that this is not, uh, there is contention in this thesis, right? I just want to put that out there. But uh, I think there's a really, so Moore's law, I think is an integral part to this. And for Moore's law for the audience who may not know is the idea that since the, you know, since computer chips were like, you know, productionalized, you've had every 18 months, the doubling in the number of transistors that can fit on a microchip, like the, the chip density, right? And that's a that's a exponential function, right? If you look at, if you're doubling every 18 months, like that's not a straight line, like if, if you're familiar with Bitcoin, right? It's a parabolic curve up. So what that I think means is that uh, it's such a ripe open field of growth, which this goes into embedded growth obligations, which I'll touch on in a moment, but the capital incentives is if you're able to basically double every 18 months, you're going to pull more capital there, not just investment capital, but you're also going to get people who decide not to be chemists or physicists, right? They're going to go be a software engineer at Google. And I make this point in the article that um, Moore's law has basically acted as like a brain drain out of the world of atoms where um, why would you like toil in a lab for, you know, you know, 30 years if um, you don't see an immediate like return on your investment, whereas like you can go work at, you know, any sort of like technology company or ad company and you can, you know, get paid a lot of money to increase click rates by like a tenth of a percent, right? And if like all of the capital and attention is here and all of like the seeming innovations is going on over here, you, you're you're gonna like you like you're not gonna be able to get that innovation. I think like back in the 70s, when kids asked where they wanted to be when they grow up, it was I want to be an astronaut, right? Or fireman like, those those things are still around, but like now today it's like I want to be a YouTube star. Right. Like that's what like kids, if you ask them today, what do they want to be when they grow up? Like the whole like mind space and attention is pulled away from all of this. And 
I think there's this interesting dynamic where Moore's law, I think, is hitting, starting to hit a wall a bit, right? And I and I bring this into the world of Bitcoin miners specifically because that's something that I think casually people in the Bitcoin space would know is that like an S9 miner, um, which was from 2017, and I'm going to, I have my article up right here, so I'm just going to read it. Um, it uses 90 watts to generate one terahash a second. And the S19J, which came out in August of last year, uh, generates uh, specifically, uh, sorry, I'm looking right here, uh, 30 watts to generate one terahash, right? So over three and a half years, you basically had this, uh, you know, 66% you know, increase in efficiency of energy into computing. Uh, so this is just like, like just on its face, it, like you can see um, the, the world of like, it's, it's doing like this like crazy growth rate. But I think that th this is a common thought among people in Bitcoin mining is that you're not going to keep seeing these parabolic jump ups yeah. in computing efficiency with miners. Like if you have a miner today, it's much more likely going to be available for the next, you know, 10 years efficiently on the network where like the S9 is kind of, you know, still profitable three and a half years ago. But if I pulled a miner from six, seven years ago, those are no longer energy efficient enough to be able to do the mining, right? So the new hardware kind of crowds out the old hardware for computational efficiency. So uh, I use that as just an example, but it's, it can't go on forever. And that's ultimately where uh, I think there's this interesting conundrum where if we're not going to keep on seeing every 18 months a doubling of computing power, what do we do as a society and like kind of how are resources allocated and how do we figure out like what to do with ourselves to keep an honest growth system going forward? Okay, do you see, so um, let me just clarify with you. Uh, yeah. Do you see like a point uh, in the technological you know, uh, process or a pro or progress where there's a, sort of a limit where, where, where we can't just you know, go beyond that point or does it have to be like into a different dimension of, 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 of zero to one technological innovation in order to, to you know, move forward and have you know, exponential growth? Is, is that like what? what yeah. Are we, what so we're, we're hitting the physical limitations right now with the 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 size of the transistors. Where I think we're in the five to seven mil, uh, nanometer range right now. Uh, if you start getting closer, you actually start hitting like quantum issues where electrons hop between circuits, which actually start you know reducing your reliability. You know, quantum computing is this thing that's on the horizon, maybe 20, 30 years from now. We don't know when, but it, you're going to require like this like general step function. I would also say, though, that like if the world of atoms is kind of stagnated, maybe it's time to go back to that and kind of find the lowest hanging fruit there. I think it's from it. it, it Teal uh, describes it almost like like an orchard, right? Like you find all the low hanging fruit. We got electricity. We got the combustible engine. We get we get these easy low hanging things, and all of a sudden computers come around, and that's the new low hanging fruit. So all of the attention goes there. But what happens when all of the fruit in the orchard? are way too high up. So you need to kind of like find a new breakthrough innovation to go to that next level of like yielding like some productive assets. Uh, and I think Bitcoin ultimately, I think is going to have a key part in this in the the longer, you know, multi-decade horizon. Okay. So what are you saying is that, uh, I mean, the way I understand it is that, um, you know, uh, there's still somehow in the, in the processing uh, of, of information, right <laughs> digital information there is sort of a can, can we call it like friction there's a friction and we need to go beyond that point where with it, whatever that is you know electromagnetism or magnetic gravitational field strength or whatever that is like like uh, uh because you say you know you just said we we uh the way i understand is that we have somehow almost reached the the limit right of, of the nano sized uh you know capacitors or, or, yeah. or chips or whatever so uh, and you know when we talk about quantum what does it mean like we need to go like beyond this like subatomic subnuclear uh, uh energy level like, information sure carrier? yeah so i mean to to maybe like wrap a point on it i i'm not a physicist by trade by any means right but the, conceptually like you have this thing with computers today where you have the the, fu the fundamental building block are zeros and ones right bits um the idea ultimately is that you're able to use um, properties in quantum physics of, you know, a zero one and somewhat of an in-between. So you have a different base level building block to build the rest of the computing infrastructure on top of. Uh, that would be kind of like the idea of like the new frontier and horizon. Th the counterpoint also is that since 
you know, we've only had computers reasonably at scale, maybe for the past 20 years, right? Where like everyone has one in their house, that there's a lot of efficiency to be gained on existing software, right? And if you're a computer programmer, you're able to more efficiently use that really strong computing power to be able to do work, right? Um, I, I would like confidently say like we basically, you know, with a, a graphing, uh, the, the computing power less than the graphing calculator, we were able to land on the moon. That was a really efficient squeezing of the juice of everything we can get out of those bits. But if computing co power has increased by 5 million fold, m maybe like there's a lot of open terrain still just to innovate on that, right? Where you, uh, like this is where neural networks and computer vision, like with self-driving cars, right? They're not fully out yet, but we're seeing like maybe the question is, is like, do we find a way to have the computers train themselves to maximize all of that computing power, right? It's a kind of an open question. I don't claim to have all of the answers. I'm more of just making observations that uh, I believe to be true and that I'm kind of throwing. And the whole point of the article is me throwing these ideas out there to have conversations around this. And I think it would be a really interesting to jump into the embedded growth obligation, right? Uh, yeah. the second kind of leg of the article. Uh -huh. um, I think the first step is like, what is an institution, right? Because that th th gets thrown around a bit. And uh, ultimately, I, I just break it down to, I know, like Edmund Burke is like one of the, uh, he's a Scottish, was a Scottish philosopher who kind of uh, maybe one of the founding fathers of modern conservatism as a movement talks about like institutional forces in society. And I think just to break it down very simply, um, any like any kind of group and interaction of, of of people coming together into a group can be viewed as an institution, right? That could be a small business, that could be your local school, your parent teachers conference, like a, the parent teachers association. Uh, you know, your church is an institution, right? Like these are all just kind of these your little league team, right? If you like, if you go like you have kids and you go to like a baseball game or you know you're going to a, like a football game. Uh, you have, uh, you know, th these like little, like little building blocks of society, right? These different arms and pieces that do different things. Uh, nonprofit organizations as well, right? Uh, the idea though is that institutions can be healthy as long as there's growth to be had. And if you look at um, overall, like in the United States since its founding, there was manifest destiny going from coast to coast. You know, there was the industrial revolution, which brought all this new brand new innovation. Then you had the tech boom of the nineties. In general, like there's always been this sense of like, we can grow more. Um, the question though, is that when growth stops, do what do our, how do our institutions kind of manage and handle that? And just to kind of explain this in a straightforward way, let's take, you have a, a college university, right? Cause the university also is an institution. If you were to look at it and say, you know, I am a professor and I have 10 grad students. They all, you know, want to become professors in their own right. Uh, so what happens now you've gone from one professor to 10 grad students, all of those, you know, professors, grad students become professors. They each need 10 students to be able to, you know, have their own professorship, right. And have their own schools and funding and whatnot. You can see quickly, like it is like a direct resembling of like a, like a Ponzi scheme, like a pyramid scheme where, you can't do that forever, right? Not everyone is going to be able to provide that path. And uh, when the growth stops, you kind of question like, how do the incentives change around people to be able to stay, uh, <laughs> like to kind of keep the game going, right? So an example of this would be like the student loan program in the United States. Uh, you you can't discharge that debt. You you're you're given free money. You're giving free money from the government, right, at a very low interest rate to saddle you up with very large capital investments to go become, you know, to keep this going. Because otherwise, if there wasn't this large subsidy to education, the amount of people who go into college would have stopped a long time ago, right? But if it, it, it you have this cultural social pressure along with the financial incentives to be able to just lever up a bunch of debt and go to a university. And I think this is a perfect example of like how an embedded growth obligation from a society at large kind of operates, right? It's not that there's one person like twirling their mustache somewhere, like oh, I'm going to bankrupt the youth of the nation. It's just that you have these people jockeying together to try and keep the game going. And uh, it's parasitic and sociopathic ultimately, right? Because now um, education isn't actually about like the sense of enlightenment. It's about like, how do we get more money into our school, right? Like the incentives actually corrupt and fold in on themselves. And it's not just universities, right? You can look at 
and we can talk about a bunch of them too. I make a couple observations in the article, but it's this idea that there's this implicit idea that we need to keep on growing, get growing or die trying, right? And it's something that has very del deleterious effects on society at large. Yeah, and we can talk about actually about every structure. I mean, the, the structures I, or the institutions I want to talk about is also, you know, to, to the, the central banking structures uh, in collusion with the government. I mean, yep. and the thing is, you know, when people are like uh, brilliant, you know, uh, in, super intelligent people like Jordan Peterson, as you mentioned, Dr. Jordan Peterson or others talk about this uh, or analyze the symptoms or, you know, the, the problems we have in a society in, in, in uh, I'm not sure whether, you know, s s um, these people like Jordan Peters, with whom I totally respect, you know, really understand or comprehend, you know, the, the, the deep cor cor corruptionness, the, the deep corruption that, that runs within these institutions. I mean, it's beyond corruption. It's so deeply corrupted, it, it invites actually for, you know, uh, corruption. Um, so I think it's a deeply structural problem we have. Whether it, you know, it's the universities or the governmental uh, institutions or the non-governmental or the, you know, the, the bureaucratic institutions, the technocratic, the banking institutions, it's, it's, it's all deeply, or even the scientific <laughs> institutions as we, yes. as we can witness now with all this, you know, COVID madness and, and insanity is going on. Yeah, I, so, so Dr. Peterson talks about this. Um, it, and this actually is where Bitcoiners come in, is that um, you have the tyrannical element of a patriarchy, like a structure of society, right, at large. And the, the, the purifying element are individuals who can step outside of corrupt hierarchies and speak truth to be able to communicate like that information and value to start trying to revivify and restore the structures into a more honest order, right? Uh, I think that uh, I, I want to get to the to, to really drive it home for the corrupt institutions. I think the the Federal Reserve, as someone obviously as someone who, who loves Bitcoin, is probably one of the chief institutions. I think that I actually call him in the article the chief growth officer of the country, right? Because it's not to say that like everything since 1971 has been a lie, right? It's not like there hasn't been anything going on. Like as we talked about, the world of, of bits has massively shot through the roof and it has fundamentally transformed our lives. And there's been a lot of honest growth that's come out of that. But what about dishonest growth, right? Because I don't think like, like all growth is equal to each other. And I go into the conversation about how the Federal Reserve fundamentally alters the contract between the present and the future, as well as with, with monkeying of interest rates, increasing the window of debt instruments. And, uh, you know, are providing artificial growth. So just to quickly break that down, prior to 1977, uh, there were not 30-year bonds in the United States. Government issued 30-year bonds. Uh, and it was 25 years between 1973 and 1977. And before that, and I, I, I've been looking around, I haven't found contrary otherwise, I found on the, the US Treasury website, this kind of timeline, which I thought was crazy. Up, up before then, before 1973, all government bonds were 10-year bonds, right? And at a 10-year bond, you, as a politician, you're going to have some sort of accountability. You're probably going to be in office in 10 years, right? In, in a general sense, you're going to be, you or at least directly your party is going to be very tightly held accountable to actions you take over the next 10 years. Um, with a 30-year bond, though, with the Federal Reserve um, artificially suppressing interest rates, you've created this like kicking the can dynamic that you can print 30 year like you can issue 30 year bonds today the u.s government buys up the 30 year bonds like lynn alden calls it like a chef uh, a restaurant whose main leading customer is the chef of the restaurant it doesn't make economic sense uh and you're ultimately having is like this perpetual can kicking and this is where so much malinvestment and poor incentives are happening because the lower an interest rate is in general the less opportunity cost there is, and the less you are penalized for poor capital allocation into the future. Uh, if you're holding a 30, you buy a 30 year bond today and you're going to get one, you know, like 1.7, I don't know what the exact 30 year interest rate is at the moment, right? But like, you know, sub 3%, uh, you only have to be able to be 
like a two, 3% return to be able to like have a good return on investment compared to the U S treasury rate and the federal reserve and its ability to manipulate these interest rates. I call it's basically robbing the future, right? The idea like capital allocation and investment only needs to exceed this little pittance of, of an interest rate. You're, you're doing it in a way where it's an intergenerational theft. You're, you're, you're taking your, 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 a lot of growth has come from in- issuing government debt, yeah, right, to inject spending into the economy, which has resulted in you know, I would say many many forms of malinvestment, which we could talk about. It, but fundamentally, uh, there's nothing being left for the future, right? If exactly. interest rates were 15, 17 percent like they were in the early seventies, you know, you wouldn't be able to just print off a bunch of money. There, there would have to be serious considerations of, are, am I better off saving money for tomorrow? Right. And I think that's a really valuable idea, the idea that I can defer gratification. I can hold that money to myself, maybe give it to my kids, right? And have them make better decisions later, right? Like I, th- there isn't like, I call it basically like there's a gun to the head of every institution. It's like, we need to get growing. We need to get growing. And the Federal Reserve, as the chief growth officer, just keeps supplying cheap money yeah. to where bad decisions just keep and, on. And who, who buys? I mean, I mean, besides, you know, the U.S. government, but but uh, I mean, there must be some like China. Do they like do they own? Do they have they bought all these whatever 30 year treasury bonds? I mean, so who, or, as of 2014. Like, so as of 2014, China has been a net divester of U.S. government debt. Before 2014, I believe they were one of the parties that were buying that debt. But um, I think corporations, I think Michael Saylor talks about prior to going into Bitcoin, yeah. he parked his money there because he had no other option, right? Exactly. Like he's, he's yeah. not going to have the cash sit there. He might as well earn some menial interest rate to be able to do something with his money. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so, then you have the pension funds, right? The pension funds, the, you know, the huge multi-trillion, you know, pension funds everywhere globally, especially in the United States. Are yep. they obligated like to to buy a certain a specific per- percentage of, of these bonds, of these junk bonds? <laughs> yeah, so th- there are structural mandates that they have to allocate a certain money to bonds. Um, and this is what the problem is, is that another, like not only do you have the government like buying a bunch of, bunch of this debt, I think further suppressing the interest rates, but if everyone's kind of, I'm just trying to think through how I want to say this, right? Is that like, if everyone's compelled and mandated, as as more people buy a bond, the interest rate goes down, right? Because the interest rate is kind of the price on money into the future. And if you have more people demanding that asset, the interest rate goes down because you're, if, if, me as the bond issuer, I don't need to pay you as much if there's a bunch of people behind you that are willing to buy that bond. Uh, yeah, so this is where I think like with... Uh, embedded growth obligations, I, I talk about um, the company IBM, right? Uh, they allocated $203 billion in stock buybacks between 1995 and 2020. My the, the current market cap of, the, of IBM is only $128 billion. You have to wonder, like, this is talking about like kind of a prisoner's dilemma that develops in an institution. And I, I used to work at IBM. Uh, I love the team that I worked on and we were um, very productive and we did really great work. And it's, I learned a lot from being there, but it's a company with 300,000 employees, right? So like you have a tight crew, then you do great work and you do, you, I would say we, you know, did innovations and and built great things while we were there. But uh, at the end of the day, like this larger company uh, executives, this is a perfect example of an embedded growth obligation turning parasitic, uh, you could allocate that capital, all of those free cash flows that IBM is generating into moonshot projects into the future, which is kind of what Google does. Google, like, t- they're, they're uh, a cash cow that they, makes money off ads and they throw it all into like, well, let's do self-driving cars. Like, let's do, you know, AI, like like they're doing like with Go and like all, like all of these different projects. And, they, and, the, and what's beautiful about that is that they, they throw money into things that they never see a payoff on, or maybe it's like a 15, 20 year investment, right? To actually get a return on it. The other side of that story is IBM, where the executive team gets compensated based on like the stock options. And if you have free cash flows kicking off, the easiest way to raise your stock like immediately, like today, to increase your stock price, which will in fact just increase your compensation, is to buy back your own stock, right? Yeah. And that's so where you it, get to the situation where be, uh, Robert, Robert, I mean, it used to be like prohibited, right? Be, wasn't it like before Reagan or something like that? The, the stock buybacks were they weren't they like did they? I mean, was it uh, got you know it got sort of legalized uh, with? Uh, yes, so I believe there. I can't speak to the details, so I don't want to 
say yeah. anything yeah. Uh, affirmatively but it, but here, but I believe there was restructuring in securities law. I mean, legalized manipulation. Well, that's what it is, right? It's like, basically, if you're doing a stock buyback, you're just telling all of your shareholders, hey, we have no better use for this money, right? We're, and we don't want it to sit on the balance sheet, right? So we're just going to kind of throw it into buying back our own stock. And I think that's somewhat tragic, but it's also playing to the short-term incentives, right? Me as a former, like at the time, you know, how am I supposed to communicate up to my boss who has six bosses between them and the top of like the CEO of the company? Because it's a massive you know, hundreds of thousand person employed company. How am I supposed to say like, hey, you know, I don't think our company is allocating resource and capital correctly, right? Because like, what what are you going to do? Like, they're going to go to their boss and, they're, and their boss is going to say, uh, that's not your problem. You go work on what is in your remit and, you know, don't worry about it. Because you almost, this is the prisoner's dilemma of it is that within the institution, everyone has to kind of buy into the lie, right? Because to, you don't want to rock, you don't want to be the uh, skunk at the garden party, trying to like, you know, be like, oh, wow, why are, we, why are we destroying billions of dollars in capital? Like, why are we like not like doing moonshot project? Like it basically what you'll get told is, is like, you know, that's not your concern. You worry about what's your problem and like, you know, keep your head down and keep on working because you're also rocking the boat for the whole org chain between you and the top and, you know, kicking dirt around. Like it's not a way to make friends and allies within the institution, but individuals are, as I mentioned before, are this force that, you know, if you're not reliant on the institution, you can actually speak that truth, right? You don't participate in the lie anymore. And I think that's what like Bitcoin in general is this really powerful force is that you have people that for years kind of like on the fringe, you know, as, you know, number goes up over time, they're going to be able to start build their own institutions, right? And they're going to be able to start checking these like macro forces at large, whether it's the Federal Reserve, universities, like I personally think I'm probably going to be homeschooling my kids. Like I'm not going to take them yeah, you know, to public school, yeah. but okay. like but this is, and and like, uh, like Daniel Prince talks about this, like, like, like that was a huge motivating force for him. Um, like it, it's one of these things that like you start observing corrupt institutions at large, and as an individual, this is another like Jordan Peterson thing is like clean your room, right? Like worry about things that are directly in your control and that you have agency to be able to influence. And you're able to bring about a better world when you focus on that. And I think that's what Bitcoin is. It's this localizing force of, you know, rather you basically can opt out of, of the fraud, fraudulent game being played at large in society. And you're able to store your wealth in something that has meaningful value that will accrue value over time. And you're able to, you know, weather the storm it, it's the arc that the in, incoming flood that's coming it's the arc that you can build for you and your family to be able to seek refuge and fight another day yeah and um you you touch upon something really important uh, about localism and regionalism and you know going back to ind individual action human action as i would also call it, or austrian economists also call it um i think do you see this process taking place where there's more and more like really powerful local localized or regional uh, empowerment economies scaling up would it be you know it could be in a, in a state of united states it could be in texas it could be in wyoming and then you know eventually it will just spread out like a like a virus <laughs> like a positive virus and because you know we, we are living in times in crazy times where we, where we witnessing and experiencing like you know coercion aggression uh, oppression globally i mean on every government you know in every whether it's you know australia or uh western countries or or asian countries or or european union it's everywhere the same thing so do you see like if we zoom out a little bit like where do you see when you connect this all all these you know like uh, mind-boggling problems we have um with centralization, with with coercion, with aggression, with uh, with theft, with systemic theft going on, um, do you see like um, eventually? Are you that optimistic that it will eventually make these old structures obsolete? Yes. I, well, so I am an optimist. Uh, I think uh, Bitcoin's made me more of an optimist. Uh, NVK calls it deterministic optimism. Bitcoin is deterministic optimism, which which I love. And you can feel it around in society right now. In general, like in younger generations, like there's this extreme nihilism that's just all consuming, right? It's like, you know, especially like for like younger people who've had their lives turned upside down in the past, you know, year and a half with COVID, uh, it, it, it's this kind of like overhanging cloud that everyone just feels like a lot of angst and like, you know, tensions. For me, I think 
the pendulum, like in a macro sense, is swinging towards smaller localized governance. And I think the reactions to policy with COVID have been a really strong bellwether for this, where like I know a lot of people who are leaving the New York City area and they're moving to Texas, they're moving to Florida. Um, you're you're finding a sense of like this reshuffling balance of people wanting to go to communities that, you know, that better reflect their values, right? And I think uh, Bitcoin is part of this tool set to be able to, you know, take your wealth, move somewhere else, right? Uh, ultimately, yeah, I think that's I think that's the way the directional sense of things are going to be going. It, it may take some time and it may not be the most straightforward path, but I think it, it, humans in general are naturally just tribal, you know, creatures. So I think it's maybe a reversion to like more some baseline uh, preferences that humans would have at large. Yeah, it's you know when we observe what's going on, um, it's it it. I mean, it does seem that we are we bitcoins or whatever we you know, the critical thinkers, mm -hmm. the open mind was the you know the ones who really want to transform and change <laughs> these the structures. That we are in a really small minority, you know, and mm -hmm. it's always been like that. You know, it's like a, a small critical mass or you know a cr a critical. Uh, a minority that has really, you know, pushed uh, society or humanity or civilization f uh, forward. So this is why, you know, I want to go back, to, come back to this uh, time of what do you call it, like uh, uh, the window of opportunity or whatever you want to call it, uh, for this transition. I think the key is transition, the, tr the transformational transition. And as you said, you know, Bitcoin is a tool. It's 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 the root key, the root solution to everything we've been we've been dreaming about. You know, uh, but do you see like not only structurally, but let's just say you know, technological. I mean, we are seven point five or eight billion people on this planet, and you know, with all the, I mean, you know, forgive me my my the terminology, but it is eugenics what's going on and the eugenic movements and population reduction it is what it is i mean people can talk about conspiracy theory but they are i mean just uh, whitney webb just lays it out really beautifully and connects the dots and i think we need to to, to create not only the structures but to bring out the technologies that have been whatever not disclosed hidden or compartmentalized or patented or whatever or just you know uh, or within the military industrial complex like bring it out and so so that there is a civilian use for that you know for society at large What's i would call it malthusian right this idea um and the perfect malthusian villain in modern times would be like thanos from the avengers right he wants to cut half of the world half of the all living things in the universe because he believes that there's a supply shortage right this was a, a popular theory in the 1970s of the population bomb that like we were going to grow to a point where we weren't going to be able to sustain life anymore on this planet and it's it's malthusian and i think this is this is somewhat perpetuated by embedded growth obligations and let me break that down for a moment if there's no honest way you're able to grow whatever you're talking about, like your business, there's no honest way to grow your business. If there's no honest way to grow, you know, like any, any institution in its own sense of, uh, you feel like the walls are caving in. Like I basically, it becomes a zero sum game where since there's no more growth, I only gain if I take from you. Right. And I feel like this like deep sense of, you know, zero sum thinking is what kind of enables this pathologic mindset where uh, no one, like, I'm just thinking through this. Yeah, so like, you you have this sense where everyone has to cheat and lie to each other to be able to get ahead, right? And it, it's very, I, I think, and 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 not in a in a literal sense to your own soul, it, it 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 deforms it. And I think it's this very corrupting agent that makes you feel like, you know, you need to go out and get yours and damn everyone else. And this is what I think about with Bitcoin is that Bitcoin provides an honest means for growth where growth can no longer be gamed. It has to be earned in a free market transaction, right? And I think the, like, the money is a huge part of this, right? Is like, why, if, if 30... And I talk about this like with experts within institutions. Like economists tell you that, like, you know, the inflation like year over year is five percent. Well, th one out of three dollars have been made in the past twelve months. And I'm told, you know, because you know, hedonistic adjustments and the price basket and all of these different elements, 
it's more of a 5%. And it's like, well, it sounds like there's a lot of gaming and card shuffling um, and kind of like obfuscation going on there. I want to go to the raw empirical fact that we can all agree on. One out of $3 were made uh, since the start of 2020. I've been saying that point for the past year or so now. So I used to say in the past year, but since March of 2020 and th- three out of $4 uh, have been made since 2008 in the financial crisis. That's right? mind boggling. Yeah. Yeah. This yeah, is absolutely insane. And, and, so and insane. people, yeah. you look at the M2 money supply, like it, it, this, this isn't, this isn't an opinion. It, Right, the M two money supply has gone up by that much, and I wonder why there hasn't been any hype inflation. This is something that really like baffles me. Why? Well, we have asset inflation. Asset, definitely, yeah, yeah. So it's asset inflation, right? Is because ultimately what's happening is is that those who hold assets, all of this new money is looking for a refuge to be able to hold their power, purchasing power in, and that's why like you know real estate. I actually mentioned. I was talking to Ben. I talked to him all the time on Clubhouse from uh, Ben Prentice from you know WTF happened in 1971, and if you price how many years of savings to buy a house in 1970, and I have this in the article, it was 2.4 years of of savings could effectively buy you you know a house. Now it's seven years, right? And you're talking five extra years of you working to be able to make sure that you can maintain like and like buy a home. And I think this is part of like other forces in society where like people aren't having as many kids because there's a large sense of uncertainty in like, how am I going to be able to provide like my next rent check, let alone provide for another kid, right? And I think this is usually what you see among Bitcoiners as a general group, right? To start, like uh, to talk and generalizations usually tend to be more optimistic. They want to have kids. Um, they believe that, you know, there is a better future to be had for our kids. And this is a point I make in the article as well, is that the get, grow, and die trying, this Malthusian struggle of zero sum, I only gain if you lose, has this horrible downstream concept. And, and this is all communicated within price signals. If interest rates are kept low and you're not able to save for the future, like how are you supposed to tell your kid that you know, if they work hard, they're able to make it in this world? Uh, it, it's, it's fundamentally theft to keep on growing today, right? Because it's like we're at a place where the rate of growth needs to be maintained by any means necessary. Otherwise, things start contracting and moving inward. And that's what doing uh, $80 billion a month in new money being made to buy government debt, right? Like that's what that is. It's like, because we can't have it pause. It has to keep on growing. And it, it's this force where ultimately Bitcoin is a check on it. And what Bitcoin kind of does going in through the back door, it says, well, we're an asset. So we're going to ride the asset inflation bubble with everyone else. But we're not, we don't require... Um, like every month, the government buys forty billion dollars worth of mortgage-backed securities, propping up the housing market. We we don't need government intervention to be able to keep on thriving. We're we're going to be able to since we have a true free market. There are no circuit breakers in Bitcoin. If you remember in March of last year, when the the whole financial like COVID like crisis started happening, th- the market would open and immediately shut down for fifteen minutes because everything was down over ten percent. Right? You had these circuit or it's like eight percent. Like you had these circuit breakers. They call it. There there are no circuit breakers in Bitcoin. So we just went directly sixty percent down. Right? Like there there is there is no one stopping this train. And we also trade twenty four seven three sixty five. Like Bitcoin markets do not turn off. Right? You have these like in a true wild west free market, you have this volatility because it gets beaten around a lot. But I think this is the anti fragile properties of Bitcoin start to emerge in that there is no guardrails protecting it. So it has to learn how to stand on its own two legs. And yeah. I think that's a part of like the larger Bitcoin thesis as an Excellent asset and, yeah, Robert. and the technology. Yeah. Um, let me ask you something. You know, there's people, you know, the, uh, it, the problem is, you know, with this number go up technology, it's, it's and, and denominating it constantly into fiat and comparing with fiat. Do you think there comes a point where it really doesn't matter what, you know, what fiat price, dollar, or euro, whatever Bitcoin has, whether it's 30,000, 50,000, million, because the, what do you call it? The, the, the measurement, the, the comparison I think should be to the, uh, and I think we're still a long way from that. It's sort of, you know, I think it's gonna happen in the next maybe 10, 20, 30 years or something, but mm-hmm. where it really doesn't matter uh, maybe it could happen in the next few years uh, where we just measure the purchasing power. 
because by that time, maybe uh, you know uh, there's going to be economies of scale or localized economies. There's going to be more and more countries. You know, El, uh, El Salvador is going to you know make it legal tender. I think in the next whatever seven to ten five years, days. Something or yeah. five days. I mean, this is huge, and I think it's going to be a chain reaction. So, do you think there's there's going to be a, a point in 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 this process where where you know we just don't measure it in fiat anymore because it's just all about purchasing power. Because it doesn't yes. make sense, you know, to deny eventually, eventually, I think that's the that's the terminal end point in all of this. Um, I I try to be I am an optimist, but I am cautious in the sense that I don't think it's going to happen in the next year or two. I think that um, with central bank digital currencies on the horizon, they're going to and negative interest rates imminently coming, they're going to try and keep, kick this can for as long as possible. Um, I, I think this is also um, I think a fair critique in having conversations with Eric on Clubhouse is that number go up is a powerful way to check people who say that we're wrong and we don't understand things. But you need to have a culture that's beyond number go up, right? Because otherwise, you're just another institution with an embedded growth obligation. Price go up, price go up, price go up, price go up, right? Like there, ha there will be a point, a, a terminal growth point in Bitcoin, and it probably won't be for, you know, 50 to 100 years from now, where there is almost no new net Bitcoin being made. And we're all going to be basically structuring ourselves and like, how do we move forward in that society? And you're going to have probably like a deflationary system where as productivity increases in society at large, your purchasing power is going to increase for the assets, the, the Bitcoin that you hold. And you're going to be able to focus and invest on other things rather than trying to get an immediate ROI. Um, to your point about like, I, I, I agree, like it, it's, it's an inefficient ruler, right? It's a ruler, like Preston Pish calls it like a ruler that changes size you know, every day when you look at it, it's it, like an inch is no longer an inch, a foot's no longer a foot. It doesn't even make sense. And I think there's going to be increased chaos as this starts playing out towards the end game of how is this all going to work? Um, just as a side note, I love this. There's an article from Arthur Hayes, the CEO of BitMEX from uh, Stablecoin Triptych, I think it's called from like maybe a month ago. I'll have to go look it up on the BitMEX blog, but talks about how central bank digital currencies are a modern government's like, fantasy when it comes to working with the population because there's several aspects. One, you have full data transparency on where all money goes, right? Like as a as a data problem, that's beautiful. Incredibly yeah. powerful thing. Two, yeah. you're able to individualize monetary policy, right? So like if if the government says like, oh well Rob's doing well and he already has two kids, like let's, you know, he doesn't get as much of an interest rate as maybe someone else, right? Like you can start in like, oh, like here's some money from your paycheck. It, you need to spend it in the next month. Otherwise it disappears forever, right? You're able to do these controlled A-B tests, kind of break the fungibility of money in a way where $1 to me is not the same as $1 to you and massive surveillance, right? And you're going to be able to like, in a CBDC world, force negative interest rates. There is no opt-out, right? I don't get to just hold on to my cash. Like I, my, my cash literally dissolves in front of me over time. So I'm not surprised if in the next five years, like that becomes introduced into the conversation as a normal thing. Kind of like you would see conversations of inflation's not happening, guys. Like this is not an issue. Like we have it all figured out with modern monetary theory. Don't worry about it. And then you started seeing articles that like inflation's here and it's a good thing. You know what I mean? Like you, you flip the perspective all of a sudden when you start realizing like there's been a narrative shift as Michael Malice calls it, like the cathedral, like, like, the sense-making or institutions that we have, like the media, start being like, there is no you guys are conspiracy theorists. There is no inflation. It's only two percent. It's only two percent. Oh, actually, inflation's here and it's great. Like you, you want inflation, and I think this is like cynically, like you can look at it and be like, well, you're just a liar. Like that's not actually true. Um, yeah, but We're that, lying on the consumer price index. I mean, the most fraudulent, <laughs> deceptive bullshit that's ever been invented. Uh, what Michael Saylor calls it, right? Inflation is, is a vector. It's not a single data point, right? Because yeah. you have your own personal basket of goods of what matters. And if you have a consumer price index and it doesn't baseline include energy, right? Like in food, like, is that really a mean? Like you try living life without energy and food. And tell me like how that goes for you, right? Like it 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 doesn't end well. Um, yeah, that's just another example of just like and this is like my point of the article is like I think the more interesting conversations to have uh in Bitcoin, especially if you've been here for a while, because there, there's stages in your journey and learning and growing about Bitcoin, is that 
you know, does this technology work? And you spend probably a decent amount of time trying to batter it around, think about it, beat it up, trying to see like, where are the holes? Where are the gaps? And then once you kind of get comfortable with it, you know, it's like, you know, Bitcoin's the best. Everyone needs to be buying Bitcoin. And I think you get to a, a certain place in everyone's journey and stage where that, 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 that field has been kind of farmed out a bit. And you want to start thinking about like, let's just, let's just move forward into the future. Like what are the deeper conversations and the more bedrock principles we could be talking about of what Bitcoin does for the world, assuming it's already won, right? And I think because like, and this is part of my growth on Clubhouse was my first week or two was explaining like how to use a hardware wallet and like what's a node. And and over time, you then you get into this phase where like someone shows up and they're shilling some other coin and you start talking about like digital scarcity, like decentralization. You start going down this rabbit hole, threat modeling. And then at, at a certain point, you're just done fight. Like there's no more fight here, right? Um, and that's why I think fun, it's funny on Bitcoin Clubhouse, there's maybe a crew of a couple dozen of us that are in rooms. There is no other coin community on Clubhouse. And like not in a real meaningful presence, not people that we don't like kind of tease and clown on. And we get into conversations. Like you have a long dialogue with you and I right, right now, Kayvon. Like what I love about like the audio element is that you get to push around ideas more and you get to see like, what are people standing on as their first principles of what they're kind of thinking and negotiating through? And you start quickly understanding um, most at-large critics I wouldn't consider to be um, serious and like their critiques of Bitcoin for one reason or another. So you kind of just like, you know, it's not an efficient time to spend your energy. Like that Satoshi quote, like if I don't have, like if you don't get it, I don't have time to explain it to you, which I think is a key bridge of if someone in good faith is asking questions, if they genuinely do not know and they're genuinely new to this, I, I, I spend hours yeah. a week yeah. talking to people about it, right? But you get to a point where- It was for most people, you know, especially right. when it comes to family, friends, and people yep. who you would, you know, expect because they're so intelligent, intellectual, <laughs> but, you know, you get disappointed every time, you know? It's like, I hear this all the time. Like, people, like, are so depressed because of their environment, you know, the family, the friends, they don't listen. They, you know, you can just plant a seed and see what happens next year in a two, you know, or, or two or three years, they'll, you know, like just mm -hmm. wake up like Neo out of the matrix. <laughs> And right. finally, you know, ask the one question, you know, and I think there was a saying like, I seek not to know the answer, but to understand the question. And I think people really need to understand, to ask themselves, like, what do I want? What do I want for my children? And I, you know, that's why I loved your conclusion also yeah. in the article. Like you, we do this not only from our children, but for our grand grandchildren. And, um, and that's why I want to, you know, also maybe uh, uh, sort of conclude uh, with you or uh, wrap it up with, uh, it's beautiful. He said, you know, Bitcoin is an integral piece in answering this question. This goes far beyond personal monetary gain. This is There's a bright orange future for Bitcoiners where we are not caught up in quarterly earnings, but in developing intergenerational wealth. It is not enough that we succeed our great, great grandchildren that we may, that we may never meet. We will never meet them. Did you free? Uh, Amazing. Oh, my internet just skipped for a second. Sorry. Yeah, Thank yeah, you. Yeah, 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 um, yeah. I, I, I'm back. I, I, I know I'm pulling up that exact part of the piece because this is like near the end of this three hour interview, which I link it in the article. I'd highly recommend anyone who finds this conversation remotely interesting to go listen to that episode one of the portal. Um, Peter Thiel kind of pauses on this thing right near the end. And mind you, this whole three hour conversation, Bitcoin or the money never comes up. And he says, one of the challenges, and we should not understate how big it is, is in resetting science and technology in the 21st century is how do we tell a story that motivates sacrifice, incredible hard work, and deferred gratification to the future that is not intrinsically violent? And you, you hear that, and that's Bitcoin, right? That's Bitcoin. It, it, He's so it, sharp, it, 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 but he gets it. He totally gets it, Peter Thiel. But I don't know. It just, uh, I mean, he, he, I mean, he's, he's a, a big investor Bitcoin. in Bitcoin. He actually called he, himself Bitcoin maximalist, didn't he? Like, yes. when he connects with China, whatever, national security. And he said that, he had this really funny point of uh, basically that, you know, FANG stocks were like one of the best performing assets over the past, you know, 15 years. And it was because Jim Cramer came up with an acronym one night on Mad Money and that many hedge funds were too, like they were too proud of themselves to follow that investment thesis because it was so dumb. And his point was that for the next 10 years, Bitcoin is going to be that asset, right? Because he, he is... He is yeah. a Bitcoiner, right? Yeah. And he's like, you know, Bitcoin will be that asset that's going to outperform most things in the next 10 years because it's going to be just so silly that people aren't going to want to make that allocation, uh -huh. um, I, and which I totally agree with. And this was something that I think, you know, I, I have I have two kids under two years old now. 
and this is something that starts really crystallizing into your like to the, the quote that from the end of the article you read is that it, it's not enough that I succeed. Like it really needs to be this true success has to necessarily be defined that and Jordan Peterson talks about this, like in a game of whatever you're playing, like an evolved game, it has to be one that's iterative, right? You're able to keep going back and playing that same game. And this is evidently not sustainable. The way our society is structured right now is not sustainable because it's reliant on this continual can kicking. And for me, success is that my great, great grandchildren that I will never meet have to be able to also succeed in the society that we're working to build. Otherwise, it's not, it, it, it's it's a fleeting sensation of victory and it doesn't matter. And I don't want to condemn my kids, my, my kids, kids, kids to a worse future than what I have. I want like, and it, and it, it's perspective shift you have once you have a kid. And I've had this conversation with people that I know is that, yes, I will still be doing things, being productive in life. I'll, 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 I'll still be trying and working hard. It's not about me anymore though. It's, it's about my kids. Like, like all of the energy and focus now is how do I structure and set them up so that when they go off into the world, you know, 17, 18 years from now, how are they going to be able to be best armed to be their best selves, right? Like, it, and I think this is something that's fundamentally missing in a lot of society is that it's all about what's happening today. And the nihilism, I think, is accompanied by this is that people don't see a better future for tomorrow. And I think it's this like very sad force which i very much understand and empathize with right yeah. like i'm not saying that it's not un like feeling it, it wouldn't be unwarranted but you have to kind of break through that struggle and go forward like and that's why i think that bitcoin is such a key piece in being able to act as a technology a savings technology right uh to be able to break through the short-term chaos like the, the short-term nihilism and chaos into something that's going to be a better guaranteed future for tomorrow yeah. And, you know, Robert, I mean, you hear that probably from a lot of Bitcoiners, you know, if it wasn't for Bitcoin, if Bitcoin didn't exist, I mean, we would, uh, I think I would be totally depressed because I, you know, I, I share the same sentiments and feelings and you speak from, you know, like out of my heart and soul, like, like I have a, we have a seven month old a baby girl and it's like, what kind yeah. of world is she going to grow up in? You know, with everything that's going on around, it's like, it's preoccupying my mind, like, you yeah. know, uh, consciously in my dreams, even, I mean, it's, 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 you know, it's uh, the whole focus is on the child, you know, it's, uh, it's, you know, the your soul connection, your love, your everything, you know, your hope, your desires, your future, your evolution. <laughs> so, Absolutely. so Robert, yeah, I mean, are there any final thoughts or anything we wish uh, you want to mention? Like, uh, where can people find you or anything? Any final thoughts you want to share? Yeah. Um, I mean, I can be found on uh, Twitter at, at ROB, the number one HAM, Rob One Ham. Uh, I would, if, if you're, if this conversation interested you, I would go to Bitcoin Magazine. You know, the name of the article is Why Has the Physical World Not Progressed Like the Digital? Um, I think that, um, Fundamentally, thank you, Kayvon, for having me on. I enjoyed the conversation. And um, I would encourage everyone to just start thinking about um, spending some of their time thinking about what do they want, you know, their next, you know, 20, 30 years looking like. And, and how do you how do you as an individual help break the cycle in a way to be able to provide a better future for you and your family? That would, I think is it's it's where I spend a lot of my time and thought and energy. Um, and I think the open question. Uh, to have is is how do Bitcoiners build institutions or maybe revivify the existing ones in a way that we can break the cycle and kind of bring that bright orange future that I mentioned in the article to to everyone around us and being able to uh, you know make the world a better place one step at a time one block at a time. Yeah, no, Robert. Really appreciate your, your your sharing your knowledge and your ethos. And you know, you. I mean, in my in my from my perspective, I think you there are really few people in the Bitcoin space. There are there are more than enough, but there are few people who understand it like not only within its essence, but also holistically. As I have no better word for that. You know, like what why are we doing this at the end of the day? You know, mm -hmm. what is it for? What, what are we desiring? What are we striving for? What, what's what's the you know what's the ultimate goal? You know here. Yeah. Yeah. So, Robert, thank you so much. And uh, I'll put everything in the show notes and uh, hopefully talk to you soon. Maybe even maybe I, I was thinking even together with Jeff Booth, that would be the perfect combination. You and Jeff Booth. Yeah. Wow. Uh, 
I'm I'm just a, a humble Twitter pleb. I'm not worthy of uh, being in the same yeah, room but we need more with Jeff Booth. But we need more of you. <laughs> okay, Robert. <laughs> Thank you so Thank much. You, I'll talk to you soon. Okay. Have a great yeah, Sunday. Excellent. Yeah, bye bye. You too. Take care. Bye bye. All right. So this was Robert Hamilton, um, and. I want to really thank you again for listening, for sharing. Subscribe, please, to my YouTube channel, to my uh, Twitter handle. And of course, don't forget to uh, follow Robert Hamilton on Twitter. I'm going to put a read the article. It's a great, I'm sure there are going to be more articles coming up uh, in the very near future by Robert Hamilton. And yeah, and I think we all need you know, to start with ourselves, uh, take the initiative. Uh, plant the seeds because we can't force it upon whatever people we know, friends, families, neighbors, relatives or whatever. We can just plant the seed, give them whatever from whatever perspective and angle, information, inspirations, ideas, uh, you know, from your heart, from your soul, from your intellect, from your mind, from your uh, vision. And uh, eventually, you know, we will, the critical mass, and that can be three, four, five percent of the Earth population, can start, you know, triggering this transformation on every level we can think of structural transformation, technologically, societally, uh, even spiritually, uh, but especially structurally. And uh, to finally, you know, make all these criminal entities and structures finally obsolete. It's institutions, structures, you know, that are, and we all need to, you know, start with ourselves and eventually we will, we will succeed. And uh, it's a process. It's a process, but I think it will be an exponential process. And that's the good news. It will be like a hyperbole and with a, we call it hyper-Bitcoinization, mass adoption, uh, you know, local economies denominated in Bitcoin, El Salvador, you know, going big time. So it will, I think there will come a tipping point where everything is going to just, just, just transform itself. And uh, the job is already done for us. We all, we just need to, you know, put more like energy and information and education and empowerment into the hands and minds and hearts and souls of the people. Well, thank you so much again. And uh, if you have any questions, my email address is kd at kvandavani.com. Uh, again, my show is called the Kvandavani Connection Show. And I'll see you soon again. Thank you. Bye.